Hi, I'm Dr. Steve Whitland. I am Associate Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine at the University of Rochester, and I am the Director of Diabetes Services and Clinical Director of Endocrinology. We're here today to discuss diabetes because of its rising incidence both in the United States and worldwide. It is not only a huge problem for individuals comprising more than 8% of the U.S. population, but also it's extremely costly because a patient with diabetes costs about four times more than other individuals. And in this day and age of fiscal crisis, diabetes is an extremely expensive disease for the U.S. population. Diabetes comes in a variety of types. The two classical types are called type 1 and type 2. Type 1 diabetes, which formerly was called juvenile diabetes, is due to the body destroying its own insulin producing cells. They are essentially wiped out and given our current technologies and current treatments, these people require insulin lifelong. The other type of diabetes is type 2 diabetes and that accounts for 90 to 95 percent of people with diabetes. The cause of diabetes is hotly debated but what is clear is at the time of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, people A, make too little insulin in response to their needs, and B, are resistant to their body's own insulin, so that they have an increased requirement for insulin and an inability to meet that requirement. Insulin is required to regulate the body's glucose. Glucose is required as a fuel for all of the organs in your body, and especially for your brain. The brain is the largest consumer of glucose in the body. The importance, however, of having an adequate sugar level is reflected by the fact that there are about half a dozen different hormones in your body to keep your sugar up, and essentially only one to keep it down, and that one is insulin. The classical side effects of diabetes can be divided into two types. Those that affect big blood vessels, we call macrovascular disease, and those that affect tiny blood vessels, we call microvascular disease. The macrovascular complications are what we sometimes loosely term arteriosclerosis. So it predisposes to strokes, it predisposes to heart disease and heart attacks, it predisposes to heart failure, and it predisposes to impaired circulation to your legs that can cause pain when you walk and sometimes gangrene of the feet. The small vessel disease, the microvascular disease, can cause damage to the back of your eye called the retina. It can cause damage to your nerves because your nerves have a blood supply. And it can cause a variety of symptoms in your nerves such as classically numbness and tingling. The feet usually, it usually occurs in the feet before it occurs in the hands. It can cause pain. It also can cause imbalance, so you have problems coordinating your standing. And it can affect the various organs in your body. So for example, it can affect the regulation of your heart rate. It can affect regulation of your blood pressure. It can affect your bladder so that you either can't sustain a full bladder and you wind up running to the bathroom a lot, or you can't move your bladder enough and you wind up holding on to urine and then that predisposes to urine infections. Finally, it can affect your kidneys because your kidneys have little filters that are composed of small blood vessels in them. And so it is the leading cause of kidney failure in the United States. It is the leading cause of treatable blindness in the United States. It is the leading cause of non-traumatic amputations in the United States, and it is one of the leading causes of heart disease in the United States. There have been several studies now that show that certainly the small vessel complications, the eye disease, nerve disease, kidney disease, can be prevented or postponed by tightly controlling blood sugar. That is to say, to try to keep it as close to a non-diabetes individual as possible. It's the lifestyle adjustment that we generally address is in type 2 diabetes, we try to have people approach their body weight but certainly lose weight. We want them to be 
on a healthy diet that does not cause weight gain. The second component of lifestyle management is exercise. And most diabetes prevention trials now have demonstrated that one should do 150 minutes a week or more of exercise. Now there's a lot of confusion when I recommend 150 minutes of a week of exercise. And that is, this refers to exercise over and above the activities of daily living. So if you have to take the laundry downstairs to the washing machine, that doesn't count. There have been several diabetes prevention trials. And in those diabetes prevention trials, they have looked at various drugs versus lifestyle versus nothing. What is quite clear is that there are a number of drugs that appear to delay or prevent type 2 diabetes. But lifestyle intervention is close to twice as effective as any of those drugs in preventing diabetes. So that the first treatment of type 2 diabetes should always be lifestyle intervention. Over time what you learn is that diabetes is a disease that consumes patients 24 hours per day their whole lives. It is extremely burdensome and so you have to be a little bit tolerant of the fact that people will occasionally make slips. They occasionally will quote unquote go off the wagon and you have to tolerate that. Otherwise, you and your patients will become extremely frustrated.